Happy Mother's Day from Morning Hour Chapel. I want to welcome you to our online service this morning, and I want to give a shout out to all of the moms worshiping with us today. Today is Mother's Day. Today is Mother's Day. It's a day to honor the most important women in our lives. To thank them for all their support, all their love. Driving me to all my sports and paying for all of them. My mom does my laundry, which is helpful because I don't even know how to do it. Taking me to find my prom dress, which took a long time because I'm very picky. <laughs> my mom feeds me. That's key. We all want to find a great gift and find the, the perfect card for mom has curvy handwriting. But how do you give a gift that expresses everything that a mother really means to you? It's hard to find a card that says everything that you want to say. I mean, you'll pick one up and it'll say good things at first, but then you'll be like, oh, that line doesn't even apply to our relationship. This year, maybe we should try something different. What if we gave Mother's Day as a gift for the next 365 days? Not just one day, but every day this year. Showing the love and support that our mothers deserve. We could say thank you more often, let her relax when she needs to. Making one of those little books like you did in elementary school with all of the, this coupon is good for one free back rub. Noticing things that need to be done without her telling me to do them. Surprising her with gifts and flowers just at random times. Keeping the bathroom clean. Giving her shoulder rubs and maybe buying her some new t-shirts. Mother's Day, 365 days. 365 days. I think she's earned it. And also today, a massage or something shiny that wouldn't hurt either. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. It's a different kind of Mother's Day, I know. We find ourselves unable to visit our moms and grandmoms today because of the Pennsylvania stay-at-home order. We also find ourselves wrestling with questions of balancing keeping ourselves safe from coronavirus with caring for our loved ones. And I wish I had just the right answer for everybody. But what I will say is no matter how you do it, show mom you love her today. Call her, FaceTime with her, Maybe, I don't know, drive by her house and visit from the car while she sits on the porch. Do whatever it takes to let her know that you think she's the best mom in the world. Because she is. Right now, there are over 7 billion people in the world. And God made your mom the best mom for you. Would you join me as we pray for our moms today? Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for our mothers. We thank you for the love that they show us. We thank you for the care that they give us. Father, I ask that you would bless this service and let it be honoring to our moms this morning. And pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This morning, I'd like us to sing our praise to God. Hey, if you're able, go ahead and stand up. Sing out, raise your hands if you want to. But let's worship the Father who gave us our mothers this morning. We will sing when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saint of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the row is caught up yonder i'll be there when the row is caught up yonder when the row is caught up yonder
that mothers love us by what they say and by what they do. We know them by their love. This morning, Miss Tori is going to share a message about how we all should be known by our love. Good morning, children. In our lesson this morning, we're going to use our imaginations a little bit. I want you to imagine different jobs that people do and the outfits that they wear, like a firefighter. A firefighter wears a heavy jacket and a hard hat. Sometimes they wear big boots and they carry a hose to put out a fire. A construction worker will wear a bright yellow vest and a hard hat. Also, people who are doctors, we will see doctors sometimes wearing their white lab coats. But people, sometimes we can tell what they do by looking at the clothes that they wear. We can look at their jobs and say, oh, I know that person's a firefighter. I know that person is a construction worker. However, sometimes we can't always recognize someone that is a Christian just by looking at them. If you saw a group of firemen and they were in their uniforms, you would know they're firemen. But if you saw a group of people, you might not look at them and know that they were a Christian just by looking at them. Because we wear all different kinds of clothes, and it's not that always easy to tell right away. However, in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said that there's one thing that would let others know 
that we are Christians. Jesus said that if we had love for one another, people in the world would be able to tell that we are Christians. Others can't tell that we follow by Jesus just by looking at the clothes that we wear. However, they should be able to tell that we follow Jesus by how we love each other. Jesus said, by this shall all you know, by this shall all know you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's pray and ask God to help us love each other so that others would recognize us as Christians and want to know more about Jesus and his love. And in this time when we're at home and we can't necessarily go out and do the things that we normally would do, we can still show love for each other. We can still let others know we are thinking about them and that we love them by writing them a letter, calling them on the phone, sending them an email, and even just praying for them so that they know that we love them. Let's finish with a prayer. Dear God, please give us power through the Holy Spirit to grow in our love for each other. In that way, others might be able to see that we follow Jesus and that they too might decide to follow him and know his wonderful love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take care, friends. Thank you, Miss Tori. And happy Mother's Day to you and to all of the moms out there. Uh, Dana put together a little video in honor of our moms. After the video, uh, Sammy McCollum is going to give us a scripture reading. Take a look. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoice in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 48. Parts you knitted me together in my in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are you your works, my soul knows it very well. Happy Mother's Day. Moms are great because they love us unconditionally. Love you, Mama Real. Good morning, Morning Hour Chapel. Barack coming at you here from New Jersey. Just wanna say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, and thank you for all that you do, all the mothers out there. I especially wanna say happy Mother's Day to my mother, Renee Anderson. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done in my life uh, and in my kids' life. Um, we wouldn't be where we are without you. So I was asked um, by my dad and also by uh, Sarah Nikki to read a Bible verse um, from the scripture. So what I'm gonna to read today is Proverbs 31, 25 through 31. And it starts saying, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. 
Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So I just want to say, Mother, happy Mother's Day for me. I love you and I hope you have a wonderful day. for without them you wouldn't be here and don't neglect them when they grow old embrace the truth and hold it close don't let go of wisdom introduction and life-giving understanding when a father observes his child living in godliness he is ecstatic with joy nothing makes him prouder so may your father's heart bust with joy and your mother's soul be filled with gladness gladliness because of you happy mother's day happy mother's day Today I'm going to read to you Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm. All the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and her women servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets out about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected and at the city gate where he has taken his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring praise at the city gates. Happy Mother's Day. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. That's what Proverbs says the husband and the children say about their wife and mother. And I can honestly say that I can say that about Wendy. And I think that my boys would too. 
Husbands and children, honor the woman who loves you and cares for your needs. She is indeed a blessing from God. And out of 7 billion people on the planet, she's the right wife and the right mother for your family. This morning, we're continuing in our sermon series, Ifs and Buts of the Bible. And we've been looking at these two words, if and but, and exploring how they're used in the Bible to show that God can provide blessing and rescue. And today, we're going to take a very brief look at a woman who overcame her fear with the help of her adoptive father. And he helped her to see that she needed to do the right thing. And by doing the right thing, she could save people's lives. The woman's name was Hadassah, but you might know her better as Esther. The book of Esther is about 10 chapters long, and it reads like a suspense thriller. I mean, there's political intrigue and plots against the king's life and plots of genocide and incredible twists and turns all over the place. It's, it's kind of like the James Bond movie of the Bible. And we're going to take a look at a little bit of it today, but I really encourage you to read the whole book sometime this week. It, it really is a, kind of a page turner. And there's something else that's unique about the book of Esther, if you take a look through it. Of all 66 books of the Bible, it is the only one that doesn't mention God by name. And it's interesting because even though God's name isn't written down, the work of God is seen mightily through the people involved in these events. And you're going to see how as we, as we look at this story this morning. Now, Esther lived during the time of the Hebrew exile. The exile was a time when God's people did not humble themselves and pray and seek his face. Israel had turned to worshiping other gods and had become a wicked people. And God made good on his warning from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, which we looked at last week, to scatter his people and remove his presence from the temple in Jerusalem. Basically, God allowed Israel to be defeated and carried off across the Middle East. And we first meet Esther in Esther chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Now, there was a Jew in Susa the citadel whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. And now, some people read this description of Esther about her appearance and they get offended. And what has that got to do with anything? Why are we focusing on a woman's looks? Well, the writer makes sure to mention her looks and her figure because they're important to the story. You see, Esther was the first ever beauty queen. And again, I know that's offensive to some, but just stay with me for a second. The king, Ahasuerus, was looking for a new queen. And you can read why in chapter 1 of Esther, and it's probably about as misogynistic as it reads. But remember, God uses people despite their circumstances, and he uses all things for his purposes. He can even use a misogynistic culture if he doesn't, even if he doesn't condone their behavior. Now, Esther was one of seven women in the kingdom, the whole kingdom, who were selected to compete to be the new queen. And it literally was a beauty pageant in Esther chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Then the king's men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king, and he did so. Now, it took 12 months to prepare the women for the contest. They did nothing for a whole year except live at a spa and get beauty treatments. Now, 
I know that we don't like some aspects of the story. But I know a few moms right now who wouldn't mind spending some time being pampered at a spa. I mean, I know some moms right now who would settle for a hairdresser and a nail salon. But the story goes on. After 12 months, each woman was taken before the king for a time. And in the end, the Bible says the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight, more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, one last thing we need to remember about Esther before we go on. Remember that Esther was a Hebrew living in exile. Now, she hides this fact from the king and from all the people because Mordecai told her to. And she honored Mordecai with obedience because he raised her as his own daughter. But Esther had been made queen. And very soon after, Mordecai discovers a plot to kill the king. And he warns Esther, who warns the king, and the plot is thwarted. Now, we're already seeing the hand of God working through Esther and her circumstances. God saves the king because he has allowed Esther to become the queen. Now, a little later, Mordecai makes one of the king's highest advisors, Haman, very angry because Mordecai refused to bow down in his presence. But instead of just punishing Mordecai, Haman hatches a plot to kill all the Jews in the entire kingdom. And he sends word throughout the kingdom of his plan, which he kind of tricks the king into signing off on. And we read, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Yeah, we kind of start getting the impression that this Haman might not be such a nice guy. <laughs> but Mordecai learns of the plan. And we start reading in Esther chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now Esther learns of Mordecai's distress and starts communicating with him through her servants. She learns of the plot to kill the Jews and of Mordecai's begging her to intercede with the king on their behalf. And Esther sends a reply in chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. You see, Esther knows that even as the queen, if she tries to go before the presence of the king without permission, she would be executed. And Mordecai knows that she's frightened. But listen to how he responds. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let me Read that in a little bit of a different way. If you will not stand up and help God's people, God will help find somebody else to do it. Will you do your will and risk death, or will you do God's will and save lives? 
And this is what it really comes down to for Esther, acting on her fear or acting on her faith. And look again at Mordecai's final question. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai doesn't invoke the name of God here, despite his faith in God, because according to what we read, God doesn't speak to Mordecai and doesn't speak to Esther either. And Mordecai just says, who knows? Esther, I can't tell you that God told me what to tell you. He didn't. But let's look at the timeline here. Your parents die and you come to live with me here in Susa. And then you get selected to compete in the king's Susa needs a new queen pageant and you win. And you're made the new queen. You have the ear of the king. You helped me warn him when his life was in danger and the plot to kill him was thwarted. And now, now that the life of every Jew in the kingdom is threatened, you alone have the power to do something about it. Now that's either a whole lot of coincidence or God is protecting us through you. Now, of course, if you don't want to be the protector of the Jews, God will find someone else. Mordecai's words to Esther are based on his faith in God. When he says deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, he really means that deliverance will rise. You see, prophets had been speaking about Israel being rescued and returned to their home ever since the beginning of the Jewish exile. And Mordecai believed the prophets. He believed that the Jews would eventually return to Israel and be free. And that's what he tells Esther. So Esther replies in verses 15 to 16. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young woman, women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther resigns to doing what Mordecai has asked her to do. I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if he kills me, he kills me. But before she goes to the king, Esther tells Mordecai, get all the Jews in the area together and fast for three days and three nights. Don't eat anything, don't drink anything, not even water. Now, why does she do this? Well, in the Jewish faith, fasting is prominent even today. And all fasting, private or corporate, is accompanied by prayer and repentance. So Esther calls for all the Jews in the area to fast and pray. She is asking them to humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. But Esther's purpose for calling this corporate fast goes beyond calling on God to help her succeed. Esther wants everyone to fast because her upcoming action is for all the Jews. Esther saying, if you want me to put my life on the line so that God will rescue you from annihilation, show it by dedicating the next 72 hours to God. Tell God that you believe he can not only spare my life, but yours too. Now, I don't know about you, but some of this kind of sounds like the things that my mom used to say to me when I wanted her to do something for me. If you want your dad and me to pay for your college tuition, you need to show us you're serious about college by getting good grades. And we also want you to work over the summers to help pay for your books. Wendy and I, we've done this with our own kids, and I'm sure a lot of moms out there have done the same thing. You know, we looked at Tommy and, and we said, Tommy, we're gonna let you have a car, but you also have to have a job so that you can pay for gas, insurance, and maintenance. And this is something that Wendy's dad told her. And the funny thing is, as I was sitting down writing this sermon, I heard a conversation between Wendy and Josh. And Josh was upset that he, because he didn't want to do some sort of chore that, that Wendy wanted him to do. And Wendy told him that we do our chores because we're part of the family. And being part of the family means taking care of the family. And it's not just up to one person. Everybody has to have some skin in the game. 
Well, Esther's telling Mordecai and the rest of the Jews in the kingdom, we're in this together. We're family. And if you want God to rescue us, it's time to get real. It's time to fast. It's time to pray. It's time to repent. I'm going to fast and pray and repent too, and then I'm going to go put my life on the line for you. Do your part to help this family. So Mordecai calls the Jews to fast, and they do for three days and three nights. And then we read in Esther chapter 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room, opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. God protects Esther by giving her favor in the sight of the king, and Esther's fears and her life are saved. So, does Esther save the Jews? Does the king ever acknowledge Mordecai for saving him for the plot against him? Does Haman ever get revenge for Mordecai not bowing down to him? Well, you can find out that and so much more by reading the book of Esther. <laughs> but what we can see this morning, though, is that Esther truly was put in the position she was in for a time such as this. And moms out there, I want to give you some encouragement this morning. God put you where you are, and he gave you the children that he gave you because you are the right mother for them. And even when that feels like it's not really true, it is. So pray for them and show them God by your example every day of how you love them. And kids, honor your mother today and every day because whether you know it or not, every single mother out there would say the same thing as Queen Esther said. Your mom would say, I, it might be scary, but I will do anything to protect my children, even if it means I have to die so they can live. That's how much our mothers love us. And that's how much God loves you to put your mom in your life for such a time as this. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for today. We thank you that you have given us our mothers. We thank you that as children we can be confident knowing that you have put them in our lives and you have put us in their lives for such a time as this. We thank you that you have put into our mothers the, the base instinct to love us even to the point of sacrifice, even to the point of death. Father, bless our mothers today. Give them grace, give them mercy. Give them the strength to continue on in the work that you have given them to do. To raise children who can look to them and see you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Today, this week, this month, this year, honor your mothers. Take care of them as they take care of you. Love them as they love you. And maybe give them a break every once in a while. God bless you.